Okay, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, welcome and Erev Tov, good evening. Uh, I'm right now I'll be speaking from Baltimore. Um, there is a small hur hurricane going on here. So I don't know hurricane, but tropical storm. So uh, I hope everything will will be fine. Um, my talk today will be about the election, Spinoza on the election of the Hebrews. It will be quite a lot of Spinoza, but also some issues of politics and the politics of culture and race and religion. Uh, before I begin the talk, I would like to thank a few people. First of all, I would like to thank Elchanan Reiner, uh, the, the uh, academic director of the uh, National Library in Israel, and for his very generous invitation. I'd like to thank Moria Bargil and of course Doron Levin, who is basically running this entire operation. So thank you so much. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you all for coming. The paper itself, which I'm going to present now, uh, is also available if any of you is interested. It's, it's basically pretty much done. It's available on my Academia EDU page. Uh, I think Duron should post the link for that. So if you want simply just to read the paper, you are very much invited to do so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it on the one hand, and we are also going to have a PowerPoint presentation. And you could simply, uh, uh, you know, if you have questions, and I, I hope you'll have questions. So uh, there will be a section I'll try to be done by 12.45 or 12.50, so there will be plenty of time for questions and discussions. Okay, so that's roughly my very quick introduction. Um, let's see, I want to see if I can, how are we doing well with the share screen? Okay, so we're going to do that. Let me try the share screen. Okay, we are just fine. So uh, the plan will be, we are going to have three parts. Uh, um, so uh, let's begin. Spinoza interpretation, Spinoza's interpretation of the election of the Hebrews in the third chapter of the theological political treatise en enraged quite a few Jewish readers of the 19th and 20th centuries. The rise of nationalism and the demand of loyalty to one's own genos brought about a certain style of patriotic writing aimed at Spinoza's betrayal, right? I mean, the term betrayal I'm taking from uh, Herman Cohen. In a series of lectures on the eve of the Great War, Herman Cohen portrayed Spinoza as a person of demonic spirit, I quote, and as, again, I quote, the great enemy who emerged from, from our midst, end of quote. In a stream of words more akin to shouting than to anything remotely close to analytic discourse, Cohen protested against what he took to be the universal complacency regarding Spinoza's treachery. Quote, when Spinoza with merciless severity makes his own nation this object of contempt, at the time that Rebrandt lived at the time, at the same, at the time that Rebrandt lived on the same street and immortalized the ideal type of the Jew, God, God knows what is the ideal type of the Jew, no voice raises in protest against this humanly incomprehensible betrayal. End of quote from Cohen. Cohen was right in, ad, in identifying in Spinoza an absence of ethnic patriotism. Now I'm, I'm specifically speaking about ethnic patriotism because Spinoza, unfortunately, he is sympathetic to some other forms of patriotism. I, for one, find this absence a virtue rather than a vice. And in this chapter, I will argue that inter alia, I will argue inter alia that in rejecting ethnic normativity, Spinoza was consistent with a dominant strand of rabbinic thought. So yes, I think Spinoza was highly critical of some elements of ethnic morality, and I'm not so sure that, that that's so far from at least some elements of rabbinic thought. So what precisely was so offensive in Spinoza's words in chapter three of the TTP, of the Theological Political Treatise? A common reading of this chapter suggests that Spinoza presents the election of the Hebrews as merely political, not spiritual in nature, thus, thus downgrading the importance of election. That's at least some commentators are making this claim. 
So instead of the election being something physical, it's becoming something just political. This reading is not absolutely groundless, but is highly imprecise. For as we shall shortly see, for Spinoza, for Spinoza, God's genuine election of the Hebrews, he will not deny that, indicates the political weakness of their state, rather than its strength. Apart from pointing out this important corrective, I will attempt in this essay to, cook, to evaluate Spinoza's critique of the election of the Hebrews, the result of which might lead us to some highly unexpected uh, conclusions. In the first section of this paper, I presented an outline of Spinoza's interpretation of the connection between the Hebrews' belief in being chosen and the xenophobic nature of their ancient state. In the second section, I discussed Spinoza's interpretation of the election of the Hebrews in chapter three of the TTP and show that on Spinoza's sardonic reading, it was nothing but luck which allowed the Hebrew state to survive for a rather long time in spite of its poor political constitution. The third and final part of this paper provides a defense of Spinoza's critique of the notion of, of chosenness. I will argue first that chosenness has never been granted the status of theological doctrine or principles of faith within rabbinic Judaism. I will then point out the significant religious problems with the notion of chosenness, suggesting, however, two exceptions in which, the, in which belief in chosenness might still be defensible. Again, uh, under, under very, very, very limited circumstances. I will conclude this section with a discussion of rabbinic views on the conversion of minors arguing that according to the mainstream rabbinic view on the issue of the conversion of minors, being a Jew is a merit only on the condition that the person is pious or observant, a view which is not far from Spinoza's own claims in the third chapter of the Theological Political Treatise. So that's roughly uh, the, the white picture. So part one is just on election and xenophobia. In the 17th chapter of the TTP, so well, that's uh, where we are right now. So, okay, we are fine in, time, in terms of time. So in the 17th chapter of the TTP, Spinoza presents his reconstruction of the history of the ancient Hebrew state at the time of the Bible. So Spinoza's dic discussion of the ancient Hebrew state serves partly as a test case for the political theory he outlines in the 16th chapter of the, of the TTP, of the Tractatus and is partly intended to sway his Dutch and more broadly European contemporaries from their recent fantasies about reenacting this ancient divinely ordained uh, polity. So as many of you know, I mean, in the early modern period, specifically in the 17th century, but also slightly before that, there was some sort of European fantasies about the ancient Hebrew state as a model as a, uh, of a state. And very typically for Spinoza, uh, he was saying, okay, do you want to do that? Go ahead, but uh, let's see what is the price that you're going to pay if you want to adopt the model of the ancient Hebrew state. It is indeed God's kingdom, uh, God's true kingdom. And there are some interesting elements there, Spinoza would say, but um, that's not precisely what you want. And so I'll, I'll elaborate quickly now. So indeed, at the beginning of the 18th chapter, of the theological political treaties, Spinoza explicitly tells his readers that in so far as the Hebrew state was founded on xenophobia and isolationism, the Dutch would have to give away their wealth resulting from international collaboration, mercantilism, and entrepreneurship. Were they truly keen on reestablishing the Hebrew state? So basically it's just, the argument is, it, it's a nice argument saying, you have to decide if you want to have mercantilism, you, have, you want to have wealth, you have to coordinate. And that's not the typical uh, uh, feature of the Hebrew state. If you are going to go to this, to the, if you are going to adopt the virtue of the, the Hebrew state, you are not going to have that kind of wealth that is a result of international collaboration. Thus, Spinoza's stress on the xenophobic nature of the Hebrew state was also conducive to a very concrete argument of the entire treatise. So it is, there is one reason why, at least that's, there is one uh, didactical reason where the, the stress on the xenophobic ele element of the Hebrew state was so important for him. 
Spinoza's discussion of the Hebrew state contains inherent tensions. He views the state as the true and only kingdom of God. And I'm stressing that he is really thinking, I mean, or if you wish, a divine republic, or in Latin, Republica Divina, with ostensible political, even moral virtues. So let me read a passage, I mean, just, just so that you get, get an impression about the kind of positive qualities that he finds in, the, in this ancient Hebrew state. So here's what he's saying. Nowhere did the citizens possess their property with a greater with a greater right than did the subjects of the state who, with a leader, had an equal share of the lands and fields. So there is a strong egalitarian element here. Each one was the, the everlasting lord of his own state. If poverty compelled anyone to sell his estate or field, it had to be restored to him once again when the jubilee, the Yovel uh, year came. That's again, that's uh, the topic of, of the jubilee as an egalitarian uh, element was pretty much uh, central to 17th century discussions of uh, the Hebrew state. Nowhere would poverty be more bearable than where the people had to cultivate with the utmost piety, loving kindness toward their neighbor, namely towards their fellow citizens. Let's pay attention to that. I mean, the loving kindness is limited just to the citizens of the state. It's not, it's not open to other people. So that God, their king, would favor them. No one was subject to his equal Everyone was subject only to God, right? So that's, there is a famous and true element of Spinoza where the kingdom of God is in some sense egalitarian because no human beings are basically, um, are, are ruled by another human being. And loving kindness and love towards one's fellow citizens were valued as the hate of piety. So that's a quote. I mean, that's a lot of positive, uh, uh, political qualities that Spinoza as ascribed to the, to the Hebrew state. The internal social cohesion and close fraternal relations among the citizens of the Hebrew state were complemented, Spinoza claims, uh, by hatred of their external enemies, namely all the other nations. Remarkably, Spinoza portrays both the Hebrew love of their fellow citizens and their hatred of the external enemies as begetting clear political virtues. So he thinks that even the hatred of the enemies, in so far as it becoming a kind of a religious element, it has a lot of significant virtues. I mean, that's, there is some influence, I think, of, of Machiavelli in this discussion, but we're not, I'm, I'm not going to go there. So both the love and the hatred constituted a unique political and psycho psychological reality due to the fact that the state was God's kingdom. If you read these chapters, they, by, by the way, just uh, it's basically chapter 17, there is, it's almost like uh, some of you might be familiar with this uh, quote from a famous interview with Ehud Barak when he was speaking about Israel in the early 2000s as a villa in the jungle. It's not so far from Spinoza's description of the ancient Hebrew state uh, in chapter 17 of the TTP. So let's see uh, Spinoza's own text. Okay, so here's the text. He's saying, so the love of the Hebrew state, or the love of the Hebrews for the country was not a simple love, but piety. Their daily worship so encouraged and fed this piety and this hatred of other nations that those effects had to become part of their nature. That's almost, they became a second nature. For the daily worship was not only completely different from, the, from that of the other nations, which made them altogether individual and completely separated from others, but also absolutely contrary. The daily condemnation of foreigners had to produce a continued hatred. I mean, that's actually, it's an interesting thing. What does he mean by the daily condemnation of, of foreigners? Because what do you mean by, I mean, the worship with the daily condemnation in the biblical times I mean, the most I can come with is just the, the phrase in the Aleinu prayer of uh, Hebel Varik, but um, I think it is true that as far as I can see, I think Spinoza a lot of times is ascribing to the biblical Hebrews many of the qualities of post-biblical Judaism. I mean, uh, there are, I mean, it's a separate, I have a separate paper on that, but I think in many ways, I mean, 
uh, his reading of the Bible, in spite of his intentions, is actually um, formed through rabbinic eyes, through the rabbinic education he got. So we don't know anything about what kind of, of, of uh, cult was going on in the Bible and daily condemnation of, of, of uh, other nations in this cult is not something I'm immediately aware of. I think in many ways, Spinoza again is just uh, uh, projecting from what he knows from post-biblical Judaism into the Hebrew Bible. Anyway, no other hatred, Spinoza says, no other hatred could be lodged more firmly in their hearts than this. As is natural, no hatred can be greater or more stubborn than, other, than one born of great devotional piety and believed to be pious. And they did not lack the usual cause which invariably inflames hatred more and more, its reciprocation, meaning anti-Semitism. For the other nations were bound to hate them more savagely in return. So that's all, it's chapter 17. I mean, you can see the text for himself. So in the second half of this excerpt, if this excerpt, I'm sorry, Spinoza attempts to explain the emergence of, and amplification of anti-Semitism is a result of, of a cycle of hatred, one hatred generating the other. Still, the clause which I find most striking in this excerpt is the claim that hatred of the other nations became part of the psychological nature of the Hebrews. As we shall shortly see in other contexts, Spinoza stresses that nations do not have natures and that no, that no different kinds of people, that there are no different kinds of people. Spinoza is actually one of the very few philosophers who having its almost principal view against any form of racism. It's not clear that he is entitled to this view because of his metaphysical principles. He thinks that there are some um, essences or natures of communities, but generally he he's highly critical of anything, again, it's not anything coming close to some sort of racist views. Uh, still, in this case, he's willing to speak about some sort of psychological nature which is shared by the entire uh, Hebrew community. But if the Hebrews all share the same pious hatred of the other nations, where the noid dis distinguished by specific psychological nature, right? I mean, is it not violating Spinoza's own claims that there are no uh, specific natures which are unique to one nation rather than another? For Spinoza, the xenophobic psychology of the Hebrews was closely tied to their belief that they were God's only children. They believe that, namely, the belief in chosenness. So let's, let's read a nice passage. Um, after they transfer, transferred their right to God, they believed that their kingdom was God's kingdom and they alone were God's children, and that the other nations were God's enemies. As a result, they felt the most savage hatred toward other nations, a hatred they believe to be pious. Now, then Spinoza gives a, a reference to Psalms 139, 21, 22. And it's actually an interesting question what he, what he sees there. So at the end of the last excerpt, Spinoza attempts to provide textual proof for his strong claims. It's a very strong claim. I mean, right, that the entire state was built on xenophobia. And he gives only one source, literally one source, this uh, small two verses in the Bible, in uh, Psalms, about the xenophobic nature of the Hebrews at the time of the Bible. But the two verses he cites, his sites fall far short of supporting his claims. In these verses, the psalmist simply states repeatedly that he would hate those who hate God. That's all. Now, you ask yourself, the verses contain no explicit or implicit reference to other nations. So, you know, one thing you can ask, okay, so let's see what are the traditional commentators are saying about it. So a quick survey of the main traditional rabbinic commentators ad hoc on these texts shows that hardly any of those, perhaps one, but hardly any of those understood the verse as referring to other nations. If anything, the most common tendency is to view them as addressing Jewish heretics and apostates. So meaning the apicosing or something like that. These two verses are the only proof text Spinoza cites in support of his theory about the xenophobic nature of the Hebrews. Adding to our embarrassment is Spinoza's complete silence 
about numerous biblical injunctions which prohibit the Hebrews, um, which prohibit the Hebrews to hate or abuse foreigners, even those belonging to nature with whom the Hebrews share a hostile past, such as Egyptians and Edomites, right? Deuteronomy 23.8. So the Pentateuch repeatedly commands the Hebrews to love and support the foreigner, the Gael, for example, you know, look at Exodus 22. 22.20, Leviticus 19.33. I can give you a very long list of all kinds of commandments that we have to the gear, you should love the gear. And Isaiah's messianic vision as, that, which aspires for a day in which God's house, I quote, will become a house of prayer for all the nations. Beit Filah Lekola Amin. This vision commands, the, this vision commands and injunctions are hardly consistent with Spinoza's claims about the xenophobic nature of the Hebrews and Spinoza's knowledge of the Bible, which was excellent, by the way. I was not convinced by that at the beginning, but I think he knows, I mean, he knows the Bible in an extremely impressive manner, was far too good for us to believe that he was not aware of these passages, which are cited abundantly in traditional Jewish liturgy. Uh, you know, the passages on the gear, the Beit Filai, Kareli Kol, I mean, it's just time and again quoted in the, uh, in the in traditional Jewish literature. Many scholars ascribe to Spinoza a hostile attitude towards the Jewish tradition and the Jews. And given Spinoza's misinterpretation of the Hebrew Bible ap approach to foreign errors, one might, one might understand this judgment. The accusation that Jews are misanthropes, hating all other people, mm -hmm. belongs to a cluster of anti-Semitic tropes that were quite common in early modern Europe. Still, this misrepresentation on Spinoza's part need not be a result of intentional and malicious distortion, at least that's what I have, but rather perhaps a projection, or more precisely, a distorted projection of Spinoza's own experience as a young member of the Portuguese Jewish community of his days. So let's see what was going on in, in the Portuguese community in mid uh, 17th century Amsterdam. Yosef Kaplan has documented meticulously, meticulously the way the Portuguese Jewish nation in 17th century West Europe br uh, brashly asserted the superiority of the Hebrews over other nations. These former Moranos, claims Kaplan, I quote, got out of their way to prove that the Hebrew nation was and remained God's chosen people. This was, again, I'm quoting, this was in part a response to the, to the ethnocent, ethnocentric argument, arguments raised in Hispanic 16th and 17th centuries uh, social and political literature, which affirmed in a categorical manner that the Spanish nation, Spanish nation is the obvious inheritor of the scriptural chosen people. So that's end of quote from um, Kaplan. Moreover, notes Kaplan, the former Moranos stressed their uniqueness and superiority over all other Jewish communities as well. So it, it, it's not only, I mean, it's kind of superiority of the, of the Portuguese Jewish nation, not on, again, not only about, about Jews, but about all other uh, Jewish communities. Uh, this attitude was also expressed by various regulations in Amsterdam, delineating the inferiority of Jews from other ethnic origins. So, for example, we know that there was a ban on anyone who was buying uh, meat from an Ashkenazi butcher or something. Like that. Um, it is quite likely that having grown up in a community that strongly displayed these chauvinistic elements and obviously attempted validating them with biblical sources, perhaps such as Misanech Hashem Esna, Spinoza partly inherited their view of the ancient Hebrews. So uh, again, I, I can show you in, in, in a separate paper that in many places, Spinoza reads the Bible in a very uncritical manner, adopting the rabbinic view without being aware of it. So for example, in one place, he speaks about the fact that there were hardly any harsh punishments in the Bible. And, you know, if you read the Pentateuch, there are punishments all over, but he reads, the reason why he denies, he thinks that there are, there, are, there are not, because he thinks that the rabbinic enactments of regulation that basically outlawed capital punishment by, um, by requiring very high uh, or almost impossible conditions in order to uh, convict someone of a capital offense, 
he really takes them to be legislations of the Bible, which is, again, factually pretty much nonsense. Right? So he, in many ways, he's reading the Bible through the rabbinic eyes, uh, which he, um, through, through the, the teachings that he got as, as a child in, 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 in Jewish Amsterdam. I just want to close the door. Okay, so we are done with the first part. We have two more, and I have. Okay, I, I need to speed up, but let's let's do our best. So part two. Um, Sp Spinoza's sardonic reading of the Hebrews' election. Spinoza addresses the Hebrews' alleged belief in their superiority already in the first chapter of the of the theological political treatise, but the detailed analysis of this issue is the main subject of chapter three basically on the election of the Hebrews. At the outset, outset of this chapter, Spinoza begins building up the expectations of his readers. So here is the... Uh, okay, this text... Uh, This text I'll, I'll, I'll quote briefly. We wish to show that the Hebrews did not excel the other nations in knowledge, scientia, or in piety, but in something altogether different. He's not saying precisely what it is, or so to speak, with scripture according to their power of understanding, meaning of the of the vulgus that are uh, the the real crowd of the so the audience of the um, of, of scripture. That though the Hebrews were frequently warned there were no chosen but God before all others for true life and lofty speculations, but for something entirely different. Again, he's not saying, he's just trying to gain your attention. What this is, I shall show here in an orderly fashion. So he's building expectation at the beginning of the chapter and now saying, okay, now I'm going to tell you what was it. And in order to do that, we need basically to look at a series of definitions that Spinoza develops um, at the, in chapter two. So Spinoza does not rebuff, he does not deny the claim that the Hebrews were chosen by God. Nor does he deny that the Hebrews so wonders, I, I'm quoting, the Hebrews so wonders whose like no other nation ever saw. According to both, uh, accepting both claims as true, he attempts to show that neither fact, once properly understood, is something one should be proud of. It's a very typical move of Spinoza, saying, yeah, what you're saying is right, but if you understand precisely what you're saying, that's something I would not be so much proud of. So let's see how Spinoza is building his argument. Spinoza's orderly fashion of analyzing the election of the Hebrews begins with a set of five definitions, of God's guidance, God's internal aid, God's external aid, God's choice and fortune. So let's look at the, these definitions quickly. Um, so the definition of God's guidance, uh, you understand the fixed and immutable uh, order of nature or the connection of natural things. Uh, that's De Directionem. Um, then he gives us a definition of um, God's internal aid, the uh, auxilium internum, whatever human nature can furnish or for preserving its being from its own power alone can rightly call God's internal aid. And then we have got definition of external aid, which mean, which is basically something which happens to us, but not by virtue of our nature, but by virtue of external causes. So one way or another, you are determined by God, by God's direction. But if it is through your nature, then it is God's internal aid. If it's through external elements, it's God's external aid. I'll explain it again in, in a half a second. And then you have the definition of fortune. Um, uh, by fortune, I understand nothing but God's guidance in so far as it directs human affairs through external and unforeseen causes. So. Everything is happening by God, but some things you are not aware of them and they are not coming by virtue of your own nature. And in these cases, the happening by virtue of external causes, which we don't see. And those Spinoza will say are just, is just what we call, we normally call uh, fortune. Now, um, there is also one more definition, which 
is important. That's the definition of God's choice. Uh, I, I didn't, so he's saying no one chooses any manner of living for himself or does anything except by a special calling of God, ex singulari dei vocatione, who has chosen him before others for this work or for doing this manner of living. So basically everything, every act of yours, every act of mine is chosen by God in this sense. Given this definition, let's see what is happening. So the definition of God's guidance and choice are essentially statements of Spinoza's determinism. All things happen in a fixed manner and all things happen by virtue of God's choice, by virtue, because God is the cause of all things. In this sense, every rock is chosen to fall towards the ground and the moon is chosen to circle the earth. It's not so far from the, the Yiddish expression, Bashert. everything is predetermined by God, if you wish. Then, you know, then we are narrowing on things which happen to the advantage of human beings, right? It's because of things that in spite of the inevitability of events, we should still distinguish between beneficial occurrences which happen to us, which are caused by virtue of our nature and power, meaning by virtue of whatever I know or happen to know, as when we predict correctly the future of the stock market and when, when, and those things which happen by virtue of causes external to us, as when a person absolutely unfamiliar to us gives us a fortune. So just someone puts a check of $1 billion on, on my doorstep. I had nothing to do with that. That's absolutely fortune. What happens when I buy a lottery? It's a combination. It's mostly fortune. Uh, but, you know, I, I, perhaps I, I had some knowledge. I had some tricks. God knows. There might be some element of, of my capacities, perhaps, that played a role there. Usually, it's kind of a playing between the two elements, but you have one pole, which is uh, your capacities, because you know something, because you have some power, you are getting some sort, some kind of good things. And then there is the fortune, the external aid of God, which is happening by virtue of something which has nothing to do with your nature, nothing to do with your power, just by virtue of things which happen to you uh, because of something else. Okay, uh, in the ethics, Spinoza will mark a similar, though not quite identical distinction through the notion of adequate cause and the distinction between um, action and passion, but I'm not going to discuss it. Spinoza's definition of fortune in our chapter, uh, in, in our chapter, um, covers all the things which happen to us by virtue of external causes, meaning those which belong to God's external lead, as well as uh, all the advantageous things which happen to uh, those things, as well as all the disadvantageous things that which happen which happen to us. So I'm sorry, it's both the good and the bad things that they are going to be the external lead. Just to be clear. Immediately following the five definitions, Spinoza turns to discuss the three highest goods which honorable people desire, right? So he'll tell us uh, there are three main things which people usually um, so that's the three things which people usually desire, the three goods, oh, if you wish, uh, we are just understanding, the first one, understanding things through their first causes, meaning knowledge. The second one is control of the passions, uh, or getting a habit of virtue is a kind of a moral perfection. And the third one is living securely and healthily. Now, the list, this list of highest goods of sumum bonum uh, is the same as the one suggested by Maimonides in the conclusion of the Guide of the Perplex. It's uh, 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 part three, chapter 54. Noting that the approximate e efficient cause of the first two goods, meaning knowledge, and um, and control of the passions uh, is human nature alone. You cannot gain knowledge not through uh, uh, not through human nature. And it's an interesting question why it is so. But perhaps we can discuss it in the Q and A. Spinoza argues that no nation can excel in these goods. So in the goods of the kind of just having knowledge of first causes or just having control of the passions and behaving properly morally. This is not something that you can have by just by virtue of a nature or for human or, or, or by virtue of belonging to a specific group of people. Um, 
since uh, the, laws of na the laws of human nature, according to Spinoza, are common to the whole human race, right? There are no dis real distinctions between human beings, unless we want to dream that formerly nature produced different kinds of men. That's a quote. So meaning, Spinoza again thinks that there are no dis significant distinctions between kinds of human beings. Thus, the first two goods, again, the good knowledge and morality are determined strictly by God's internal aid, meaning the qualities, the nature of human beings, the nature of specific, what, what they're able to acquire. However, unlike intellect and virtue, a person's health and security of, and the security of a state, so basically it's the good of the, of the individual or the society, are governed both by the nature of the individual and, or the state and by external causes, right? Sometimes it just happens. I mean, someone who can be very, very prudent but can still be killed in a car accident. Thus, a state whose nature and constitution are wise, are, are wise is likely to endure and survive most dangers, while a state with a bad constitution is likely to crumble following minor challenges. Of course, even a state with a good constitution might last very briefly due to powerful external enemies. So you can have some, a state that has an excellent constitution, but by virtue of lack of fortune, that it is placed next to enemies that are extremely powerful, it might be destroyed in spite of the fact that it has an excellent constitution. Conversely, a state with a bad constitution might survive for a long period of time just through good fortune and lack of foreign threat. So again, here in the case of survival of political entities, uh, polit uh, um, luck is playing a significant role. Now let's see uh, what was happening uh, in the case of the Hebrew state. I can already allude, tell you that it's, it's a matter of luck. Let's uh, see how, how Spinoza is saying that pre precisely. So I'm reading from um, uh, it's uh, chapter three, right? yeah, it's chapter three of the TTP is saying, but to form and present a social order requires no so small talent and vigilance so a social order, which for the most part is founded and directed by prudent and vigilant men, will, more, will be more secure and more stable and less subject to fortune. But again, it will always be to some degree subject to fortune. Conversely, if a social order is established by men of untrained in intelligence, it will depend for the most part on fortune and will be less stable. And then comes the, the, the key passage for me, if in spite of this, he has lasted a long time, it will all this to the guidance of another, not to its own guidance, meaning it's not by virtue of its own nature. Indeed, if it has overcome great dangers and matters have turned out favorably for it, it will only be able to wander and revere the guidance of God, insofar as God acts through hidden external causes, but not in so far as he acts through human nature and the human mind. So it would be a matter of external causes, God's external aid and fortune. Since nothing has, has happened uh, uh, to it, expect what is completely unexpected and contrary to opinion, this can even be considered to be really a miracle. Okay, end of quote. Now, in writing this passage, which appears in the midst of the discussion of the election of the Hebrews, Spinoza could have left unspecified the precise subject of these claims and let the reader infer, infer it for themselves. So you could say, okay, perhaps he didn't want to say that that's the story of the Hebrew state, that the Hebrew state was such that it was just lucky, not because it has a great constitution, but because it happened to have to, uh, to uh, survive in spite of a lousy and actually very poor constitution. But Spinoza is not a person who will miss an opportunity just to press the point till the end. So let's see the text where I think you'll see that he's making this point quite explicit. Again, we're coming back to chapter three and, um, and here's the text. He's saying, Spinoza, the only thing which distinguishes one nation from another then is the social order and the laws under which they live, by which they are directed. So the Hebrew, the Hebrew nation was not chosen by God before others because of its internal, its, because of its intellect or its peace of mind, but because of its social order and the fortune by which it came to have a state and kept it for so many years. 
This is also established most plainly by scripture itself. For if you run through it, even casually, you will see clearly that the Hebrews excelled the other nations only in this, okay? That they handled their security auspiciously and overcome great danger. Now comes the, 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 the important uh, expression. For the most part, this was just by God's external aid. It is not because the Hebrews had a good constitution, because if it were a good constitution, it would be God's internal aid. It's not because of the, they had a good political body. It's actually they had a lousy political body, and they survived. As, and if they survived, they're saying, well, they were fortunate. We were chosen. Because given what we know about the Hebrew state, it should not survive. In other things, says Spinoza, we will see that they were equal to others and that God was equally well disposed to all. End of quote. For Spinoza, the Hebrews were indeed chosen. He will not deny that, but because the state survived for a long time in spite of its mostly poor constitution, the survival of Jewish civilization throughout millennia has been commonly cited by rabbinic authors as evidence of, social, of special divine providence over the people of Israel. It is still cited like that, right? The original traditional argument, I think, is not bad at all, at least on face value. And Spinoza not only accepts it, saying, hey, how is it the case that the Jews survived for 2,000 years? And he's saying, yes, I grant you your premises more than that. Actually, I think the argument is even stronger than you think. But grants his, adventure, his adversaries more than they ask. Due to the mostly poor constitution of the Hebrew state, Spinoza claims, we should expect it to last much shorter than the other ancient polities. But in fact, it actually lasted much longer. So Spinoza say, it's not only that you are right that there is a miracle, it's a super miracle. I'm, I'm, I'm granting you everything you say about the miracle. But by the way, don't be proud of that. Instead, it lasted long. In this sense, under Spinoza's reading, the survival of the Hebrew state was an even greater aberration or a miracle of the regular order of nature than what the traditionalists would claim. Therefore, Spinoza no notes, I quote, this can, can even be described to be really, rivera, the Latin, a miracle. Alas, for Spinoza, miracles and statistic aberrations prove nothing, even if it's a very un, uh, uncommon thing. Because uh, statistic aberrations prove nothing but that very rarely, very rare things happen. Um, now, the point is that for Spinoza, if you are more wise, you don't need to count on fortune. And again, Spinoza here is, to my mind, is, is somewhat continuing a rabbinic claim, famous claim that Chacham Adif Minavi, if, if a wise person does not need special supernatural capacities. Okay, so we're done with part two. We have one more part to go. Uh, I'll do my best. Wow, uh, I'll take 10 more minutes, uh, but I won't take more than that. So the, miracle, the miraculous nature Spinoza ascribes to the survival of the Hebrew state lays bare his view of the polity as having a poor political constitution, which under normal circumstances should have facilitated its demise in a short time. The ancient Hebrews, says Spinoza, were fortunate, or if you wish, elected, but one should not be proud of such an election, which truly discloses the intellectual feebleness of the ancient Hebrews' political uh, thought. In the reminder of this chapter, of this paper, I would like to provide an evaluation of Spinoza's attack on the notion of chosenness. I will begin by briefly but significantly correcting a common view about the importance of the belief in chosenness in rabbinic literature. I will then outline some of the main arguments against this belief, arguments which I believe would be acceptable and cogent within the rabbinic context. Next, I will discuss two exceptions in which the belief in chosenness might be acceptable. The second of these exceptions will lead us to the mainstream rabbinic view that the value of being and becoming a Jew, and here, oh, and here I will argue that this mainstream rabbinic view is not far from Spinoza's own claims in the PTP. The view that the election of the Hebrews is one of the tenets or, or principles of Judaism is not uncommon among current writers on this topic. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's a value, uh, it, it, it's a, claim. 
It is, however, both misleading and wrong for two plain reasons. First, the very assumption that rabbinic Judaism has tenets of faith is factually in inaccurate, to say the least. There were indeed some attempts to define Jewish principles of faith, but these attempts were colossal failures. Almost all such attempts belong to the popular strata of literature and, wide, and were widely considered as such. So the literature of the Konote uh, Muna or Ikarin. The most important attempt to define Jewish principles of faith was carried out by Maimonides in his commentary on the Mishnah, which he wrote in his 20s. Maimonides' 13 principles were accepted by some rabbinic authorities, fully rejected by others, such as the Ari or the Radbaz or many other figures, and radically reinterpreted by still others. So it's almost like the common Jewish joke about what, what was it, the custom in my synagogue when we, you read the Ten Commandments. Some accepted, some rejected, some didn't know. The extent to which Maimonides himself was truly committed to all of his 13 principles is hotly debated by scholars. A common joke among Maimonides' scholars that might still perhaps reflect the state of this scholarly debate is that, I quote, the real question is whether Maimonides believed in seven or just six of his 13 principles. I'm not sure how many people would agree that he really uh, believed in all the 13. Jesting aside, it is a simple fact that when the mature Maimonides in his 50s wrote his philosophical magnum opus, The Guide of the Perplex, he did not find it fit to spend even half a page for even mentioning, not to say discussing, his 13 principles of faith. While a detailed discussion of this issue cannot be uh, carried out here, let me just briefly note that Spinoza himself was keenly aware of the fact that rabbinic Judaism is about laws regulating actions and practice rather than beliefs. So we have a, a nice passage in the TTP where Spinoza is saying, no, no, don't, don't expect them to have principles of faith. Moreover, if we look into the body of rabbinic discussion of principles of faith, and again, you have that, just I think, as far as I can say, I think it's a failed project, the belief in the chosenness of the Jews is simply not there. Neither Maimonides, nor Chizai Kreskas, nor Yosef Albo in the Ikarim, the authors of the three main works in this literature, include this belief in their list of tenets of faith. In fact, I'm not aware of any list of Jewish tenets of faith which include the belief in chosenness. Again, I, you know, you might find it. I mean, Golda Meir thought the claim that she believed in the people of Israel, not in the God of Israel. But again, she, she's not precisely a rabbinic thought, a rabbinic uh, source. Okay, so what is wrong? So that that's just a first claim. I don't think that the notion of the uh, of the, the claim that the belief in, in, in the Bechira, in the chosenness, is, is a principal faith in Judaism in any sense. But still, why I think that this wrong, and why I'm, I'm personally, I'm highly sympathetic to Spinoza's criticism of the election of the, of, the, of the Hebrews. I will discuss here briefly four main points, though an adequate discussion will require much more. So let's go through these points quickly. Well, first of all, lack of modesty. Rabbinic literature is very, is very, um, uh, difficult to, to draw uh, exceptional, exceptionalist generalization about this. It, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, rabbinic literature is, is a vast body of texts which spans over more than two millennia. For this reason, it is very difficult to draw exceptionalist generalizations about this literature. 2,000 years, no, um, no efficient control of, of beliefs. I think that in many issues you find views that are going in almost all possible directions. Still, if one looks carefully at the, its numerous discussion of human vice and virtue, it is hard to find a vice that is considered to be worse than arrogance. Arrogance is taking time and again to be, at the end of the day, the, the, more, the, the, the ultimate vice, uh, or at least for many rabbinic sources. The Talmudists tell us that God cannot reside in the same world with the arrogant person, and that arrogant behavior is tantamount to idolatry. Maimonides argues repeatedly that unlike all other personal traits concerning which one should follow Aristotle's recommendation of moderation, pride and arrogance should be avoided in the extreme. You should, you should do everything you can in order to avoid arrogance. Group arrogance, for example, when a group of people decide that they are better than others, still qualifies very much as arrogance. 
to the extent that the belief in the election of, he, of Israel involves group arrogance, it is clearly a religious vice because it's gava, very simply. Let's go now to the second issue, which again, I, I would argue that uh, the notion of uh, of chosenness would, would be problematic on religious grounds. And the, here's the question of, and the question is racism. So belief in the election of Israel does not have to express a racist worldview. And I will shortly explain and, and, uh, and discuss a dominant, to my mind, non-racist rabbinic interpretation of this doctrine, I, I, I think. Still, a common principle in rabbinic reasoning is that meaning stay away from the repugnant and from anything that is even similar to the repugnant. Now, the rabbis were very careful in using it on cases of, of sexuality. And, and you can agree with that, you can disagree with that, but I think that we should also be pretty careful in using, or pretty obedient in using it also in the case of uh, something which, even if it's not racism, it has something similar, it ha might have some similarities, be very careful with that. Thus, even if the belief in chosenness is not bona fide racism, but is merely similar to racism, this should be good enough reason to shy away from it and just make sure that you are as far from it as, as you can. Now, someone will come and say, why should racism be considered morally repugnant from a rabbinic perspective, right? Perhaps racism is part. I mean, if you go to some of the rabbis in Eli, they might tell you that perhaps racism is, is a religious obligation. I'm not aware of any rabbinic figure who would consider German racism toward Jews during the Holocaust as merely harmful to Jews. But because there is a complaint, people launch a complaint that it was morally repugnant. It's not only something that it was wrong that it was done to me. It's wrong. Point. I mean, end of, of discussion. And if you claim that racism is wrong, end of discussion, then you are... By virtue of this claim, you're engaging in a moral discourse, which, which is supposed to um, uh, uh, reject racism. If not, all you could say is that it was wrong to me. You cannot expect other people to behave towards you in a way that you are not committed to um, behave towards others. Moreover, the biblical commandment, uh, which is uh, uh, is basically is it's, you should do the right and proper. You should behave in the right and proper. Is traditionally interpreted as an injunction to follow common universal morality, which prohibits the abuse of any human being, or uh, any human being. Thus, at least in our days, the commandment of Basita Yashar Batov can and should be pretty securely interpreted as prohibited any form of racism. Third point, I, I'll, I'll do my best to be as quick as, uh, wow, okay. Misrepresentation of reality. Like other forms of arrogance, group arrogance is highly likely to make the agent at stake have a distorted perception of reality. Thus we find in Pirkei Avot, the canonical work of rabbinical ethics, Rabbi Levitas of Yavne's uh, second uh, advice for good life, me'od mod be very, very love spirit for man's uh, greater hope is, is the warm. Even those who do not share Rabbi Levitis' humble assessment of humanity's greater hope would still have to limit to admit that for the most part, and as far as we can, we should try to never forget our vulnerabilities. An agent, either individual and co or collective, who has a false sense of its own power and is likely, is likely to make crucial errors in achieving its aims. A collective that is suffering from a mass arrogance is very likely to, to make grave errors in navigating its way in the world. So just from egoistic purposes, I mean, um, racism is going to harm you. Last point, I mean, I'll, I'll skip that. Well, I'll, I'll mention that. The belief in chosenness and its associated display of arrogance are among the causes, not the only causes, absolutely not, but among the causes of, anti of antisemitism. True, there are many other causes of anti-Semitism, and anti semitism does not ne really need an excuse. Still, insofar as this belief has, has other severe repercussions, one should wonder about its contribution to the well-being and flourishing of Jews and Jewish culture. Obviously, not promoting the chosenness of Jews is quite different from the opposite tendency, strongly promoted 
of the over the past two centuries by the Jewish Enlightenment movement or by the Ascala of seeing uh, of viewing traditional Judaism as inferior, backward, and unacculturated in comparison with the European men. So again, I'm, you don't need in saying that you sh we should stay away from the notion of chosenness. It doesn't mean that you also need to go to the other view that basically Judaism is is uh, 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 backwards or in, in any sense. I mean, you know the kind of nonsense that you find in the Ascala. Let us turn now to, uh, I'm close to the end. Let us turn now to discuss two exceptional cases in which belief in chosenness might perhaps be acceptable. The first case covers historical context of extreme persecution and discrimination. So consider the famous story of uh, Rabbi Yekutel uh, Yehuda Halberstam, also known as the Kloisenberg Rebbe. In 1944, following the German occupation of Hungary, he was reported, he was deported to Auschwitz like many other Hungarian Jews. Toward the end of summer 1944, he was sent to Warsaw together with other prisoners in order to, to clean the land of the Warsaw Ghetto, following its demolition and the murder of its 300,000 uh, Jewish inhabitants. By this time, Halberstam, Halberst, Halberstam's wife and nine children had already been murdered in Auschwitz. During one of the breaks from the forced hard labor among the remains of the Warsaw Ghetto, Halberstam was asked by one of the other prisoners whether he would still recite the verse of the prayer referring to God's election of the Hebrews, Tab Khaltanu. Of course, Halberstam replied, in fact, I quote, it is only now that I came to understand this, this verse most properly. Pointing to the German soldier, he added, I would rather be in my current state than one of these. So in periods of extreme duress and persecution, the belief in God's love of all the Jews, even in the face of bitter historical reality, could prove to be an important source of comfort and hope. And to that extent, I cannot condemn the words of the Kloisenberg Rebbe. For Jews, periods of extreme persecution come and go, and unfortunately will continue to come and go. But once a view that a once a view that is bordering on racism is legitimized, it may well become acceptable even in normal circumstances. So that's actually the danger. If you are allowed it in the extreme circumstances of persecution, it will, for, after 50 years, it will change. Hopefully it will change. But then you don't want to become part of your culture. Indeed, the most explicit statement of the view that Jews are somehow special was advocated by 11th century philosopher and poet Yehuda Levi. And Halevi was writing in a period of extreme persecution. In fact, the subtitle of his major book, the Kuzari, is An Apology for a Despised Nation. In this book, Halevi suggests, among other things, that all Jews, men and women alike, have a special capacity to achieve prophecy, though very few actualize uh, this capacity. Halevi's claim is much more complex than is suggested in the manner in which it is frequently represented in textbooks, since Halevi held that the greatest prophet of all times, Adam, was not Jewish. Halevi did not have many followers among Jewish, medieval Jewish philosophers. In modern times, it was actually uh, Mendelssohn and Rosenzweig that were Halevi fans. But given the historical context in which Halevi was writing, one might perhaps understand his attempt to encourage his contemporary Jewish, Jewish readers. Still, the fact remains that once such ethno ethnocentric views are legitimized, they may well be used for pernicious purposes. I have one more page. Can I? OK, I'll, I'll take the, it's the last page. Please uh, forgive me for taking more time. Than the second possible exception to my general rejection of the belief in chosenness relates to the value one assigns to being Jewish. In order to spell out uh, this objection, um, in order to spell out, we would need to interrogate the rabbinic attitude to, towards the conversion of, minor, of minors. In each turn, this attitude itself is grounded in rabbinic understanding of agency and the conditional value, and I stress conditional value, of being Jewish. Let's begin with the issue of agency. So if uh, a general principle in rabbinic legal reasoning is that a person may act as an agent on behalf of, of a subject, right? Uh, even when no explicit appointment or request to serve as an agent being made, only in cases where the act performed by an agent will benefit the, sub, the subject, but not the, when the act is detrimental to the subject, right? So the principle is 
Let's, for example, I may require a gift on behalf of Ruben, even without getting Ruben explicit permission. But obviously, I may not acquire a debt on behalf of Ruben without his explicit permission, right? I, I cannot cause him damage without his permission. Applying this principle to the case of minor Gentiles who, whose parents wish him or her to be converted to, do, to Judaism, rabbinic uh, sources debated whether the act of conversion is or is not beneficial to the minor. If the conversion benefits the minor, the rabbinic court, uh, court that will perform the conversion could be considered as, as possessing agency on behalf of the minor. The main rabbinic view on this issue is that we may assume that conversion, but it's an assumption that conversion is beneficial. Yet the minor has a right to resign the conversion once uh, reaching adulthood by simply stating that she or he does not con consider it beneficial. They don't want to become Jews and that's perfectly fine. They, at that point, they can decide that they don't want that. It's not beneficial for them. Now come the more interesting aspects of this policy. Some rabbinic sources discuss a scenario in which the parents of the minor wish to have the minor converted, yet it is clear or likely, uh, it is clear that the parent will not educate the minor to observe the commandments of the Torah and mitzvot. The question is whether conversion to Judaism is still beneficial, even if the convert, the child, will not observe religious, really religious law. And I think that's here, the real, it's a really litmus test about what conception of Judaism you have. So the mainstream rabbinic view is that in such a case, conversion, conversion to Judaism would in fact be detrimental to the minor, since the minor would be much better off living as a righteous gentle than a sinful Jew. So it is not good to become a Jew, it's good to become a pious Jew. Uh, so, and you know, we, we can, I, I can give you the list of shoots. It's mostly shoots from the past uh, two centuries, whether it's uh, Shoots of the Esh or Zechel Yitzhak or Beit Yitzhak, but there are quite a few shoots uh, going in that direction. So being, being or becoming a Jew is thus a merit only on the condition that a person conducts a pious life. This conception of the value of Jewishness as a willingness to take on supererogatory duties beyond the universal moral commitments of every human being has little to do with ethnicity. In this sense, the rabbis should have no reservation to assert with Spinoza that with respect to blessedness, God is equally well disposed to all. This is all sufficiently, as Spinoza will say, this is all sufficiently established by, by scripture itself for the psalmist says, Kor v'shem dechol korav, I'm finishing. So Spinoza's critical attitude toward Jewish ethnic patriotism insulted many of his subsequent Jewish readers. In the past, in the last section of this chapter, I've argued that current academic writing on this issue of the belief in the election significantly misrepresents the traditional view. The belief in the election of the Hebrews has never been asserted as a principle of faith as far as I know, or almost never. It is part of the folklore, and that's it, it's folklore of the Jew, some Jewish communities, or perhaps even many Jewish communities, but religious, both religious and secular. I mean, secular Jews are not engaging less with this kind of nonsense. Still, when rabbinic scholars appeal to fundamental or foundational legal and religious principle underlying their attitude towards the merits of being Jewish, their stance, again, for the most part, is quite nuanced and mostly determined by, uh, by notions of religious duty and not by, any co by commitment to ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic um, uh, normativity. In this sense, Spinoza's justified critique of the belief in election is far closer to the mainstream rabbinic view than what many would normally say. Uh, thank you. And apologies for the long talk. I mean, I, I didn't expect it to be so long. Thank you very much, Professor. That was fascinating. Um, there was actually a very, very lively uh, discussion going on in the chat room throughout. Uh, I will absolutely be sure to send you the transcript so you can uh, enjoy. Um, I'll just uh, stop your sharing for a second. Okay. Um, so there, there were many, many questions, but um, as you said, the time is short. So I, I just, just want to ask you one question. Uh, Considering uh, everything that you've shown us, why in fact was Spinoza uh, excommunicated? 
Okay, that, so it's a good question. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, so we don't know. That's a bottom answer. I mean, uh, there are all kinds of explanations. I mean, right now we, the 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 text of the cherem refers to some opinions and some actions, and the explanation should include some sort of combination of the two. There are all kinds of theories uh, running around. Um, I think that most of them are very unlikely. I mean, those who claim that he was uh, excommunicated or put on Helen because of his pantheism, I think it's pretty nonsense because pan pantheism was very common among rabbinic figures in, in, in um, early modern Europe and definitely also in Amsterdam. Van uh, Coen uh, Herrera, the teacher of Spinoza's teachers, was a panentheist. I mean, it's it's not serious. Um, there are other suggestions. I mean, I don't find, I mean, Asaka Scherl and Biederman suggested that uh, Spinoza was excommunicated or put on Helen because of his interest in philosophy or studies of Descartes. It's very, very, very unconvincing. I mean, the reason is that most of the rabbis though, that were somewhat associated with the Helen themselves studied Descartes. We have the libraries of these guys. They have Descartes, they, they have Descartes, they have the Averroes, they have the Guide to the Perfect, they have the Raubach. These are not precisely the rabbis that are not going to hear anything about philosophy. It simply doesn't fit. So, uh, I think that the most important, to my mind, the most important uh, document that was discovered in this context was, was discovered about 15, 20 years ago by, um, uh, by a Dutch scholar named uh, um, Odette Vlessing. I mean, she found some interesting documentation showing that, um, that following the death of Spinoza's father, um, he realized that he he is in huge debt, and because he was at the time still a minor, according to the Dutch law, uh, he was just 23, 24 years old, and till the age of 25, you can still be considered a minor, according to the Dutch law. Uh, he, he could avoid uh, uh, getting into financial ruin. So what he did, he appealed to the uh, to the municipality of. Um, of uh, Amsterdam in order to get to be to get permission and to be recognized as a minor. Now, uh, Blessing claims that that's that was an act of disrespect towards the parents, and perhaps it was. But I think that the major problem is that that's a case in which the, we know that there are coherence. And when you go outside of the rabbinic courts, so instead of just setting the case within their community, you if you uh, go outside of the rabbinic course, if you break the autonomy of the rabbinic course, there are so many cases of, of harem that was put on this context. And I think most likely that something like that happened. The question is, that there was some sort of, I again, I imagine there was some sort of, of back and forth about uh, Spinoza basically telling he's not, that he's not accepting religious authority or something like that. Um, but, uh, but again, all I can say is that at this point, it is still, I think, a speculation. We need materials, we need documents, and, and I, I hope at some point they will be fine, will, will be found. I, I'm pretty optimistic about that, but well, let's see. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. It was amazing. There's a many, many compliments, and a, as I said, a very lively conversation in the chat. I'll be sure to send it to you. Um, I'm going to allow everyone to unmute and thank you personally. Um, so thank you, and we'll see you uh, all on the next uh, event. Oh, and, okay. And good and good night from Jerusalem. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, again, apologies for the long talk. I mean, I, I was expecting something 10, 15 minutes shorter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. What wonderful. Very inspiring. <clears throat> Tararaba from Tucson, Arizona. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you from Philadelphia. Thank you very much from Philadelphia, yeah. Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good evening, good day. Thank good you day. from Italy. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.